before uh, Pastor Dave comes and does our scripture in this morning, I felt it would be good for me to uh, lead us in a time of prayer for what's going on in Minneapolis and around the country. And I'm thankful a couple of things this week. One, I listened to a great interview um, with two pastors in the Chicagoland area, one white, one black, but both live in very racially diverse communities. One in, in a town called Rockford, Illinois, that you guys don't know about, um, but the other on the south side of Chicago. And then the other thing is um, I am... I'm grateful that the Lord put two African-American pastors in my life uh, to mentor me both in college and in seminary, and some of their reactions, some of their comments have also been helpful to me. And I want us to pray for a few things. I want us to pray for justice to be done uh, for those who uh, perpetrated the death of George Floyd. I want us to pray for our African-American fellow citizens, our neighbors, um, but especially our brothers and sisters in Christ who are African-American, who are experiencing fear, anger, and grief. We need to pray for those in the justice system to do what is right. We want to pray for safety for those who peacefully protest. We also want to pray for justice against those who are hijacking protests and are leading to rioting and looting. We want to pray for those who live in communities or have businesses where these riots are. And we want to pray for our police officers and National Guard that they would be safe as they try to bring peace and safety. And in all these things, we need to pray, Lord, have mercy. So let's spend a brief moment in prayer. Father God, we pray for our country this morning. We pray for those who are hurting, who are grieving, who are frustrated, who are angry. We pray for justice to be done at every level. We pray for those in authority to do what is right and good. We pray protection for our police officers, frontline workers, and National Guard. God, in all of these, we come to you in humility. We come to you with our cries for justice. And we say together with the church around the world, Lord, have mercy. God, that in this time, your church, followers of you, would be serving others in their community, that they would be speaking for justice where they are able, and that we would truly see the unity of the church in this time of great disunity, that as you are a God of justice, that we would be a, a people crying out against injustice. God, bring healing to our country, bring comfort especially to our brothers and sisters in Christ in the African-American community, and that your will would be done, and that even through this, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, would continue to go through our country. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today is Pentecost Sunday, and I've been asked to read the account of that Pentecost event that took place just after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. And uh, it's in Acts chapter 2. Uh, take a deep breath. It's a fairly lengthy passage that we're going to be reading this morning. So beginning at Acts 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled all the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, 
devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished saying, are not all those who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pam Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visit visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocking said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea, and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the, the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and then will, I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke, the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the end of the quotation from Joel and Peter continues. Man of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, losing, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he sat at my, he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing, for David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart 
and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. May God bless this reading of his word. Let us pray together. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we bow down and worship before you, our triune God, grateful that we are the people of your pasture and the flock under your care, and that we're able to join together once again in this place that you have provided for us. On this special Lord's Day, we celebrate the truth that we serve a risen Savior, and that His Spirit indwells and empowers us for godly living and service. This morning, our hearts are filled with so many different emotions. We feel joy just being together in your presence. We feel gratitude for our pastor and elders who continue to faithfully serve us in the spirit of Christ's love. We feel anxious about what the future holds, physically and financially, locally, nationally, and internationally. We feel righteous indignation as the enemy of our souls continues to prowl around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. But our Father, please temper our righteous indignation towards those who engage in unrighteous acts, because you are the ultimate and final judge, and that they are not the enemy, they are the victims of the enemy. In many ways, our Father, we can relate to the Apostle John. Banished and confined on the island of Patmos, John had a limited perspective. The implication is that he was losing sight of the fact that someone other than Domitian was in charge of the whole mystery of life and death. And so, our Father, you graciously and suddenly lifted him up and pulled the curtains back from heaven allowing him to see something that he never forgot. Allowing him to see that once in heaven, he wrote, that once I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven and someone was sitting on it. Help us to stay focused, our Father, on that supreme truth today and every day that thankfully you are near through your indwelling spirit and on your throne as our sovereign and coming king, no matter what is happening to us or around us. And on this Pentecost Sunday, we bow before your throne in heaven and focus our attention on a portion of your inspired word. And as we do so, and as we listen to your word to us this morning, may our prayer be, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. In Jesus' strong name I pray. Amen. 
turn in your Bibles to Psalm 25. I'm thankful to be sharing in front of you instead of completely empty chairs. So I was this close to putting posters of all your faces. Again, as with last week in Psalm 24, there's an appropriateness to God's sovereignty in giving us uh, what is just the next chapter of his word. Because Psalm 25 speaks to when our life feels like it's in chaos. Again, very appropriate. What do you do when your life is in chaos? One of the responses is to simply just give in to the overwhelming wave of all that is going around, to overwhelm by out-of-control circumstances. Another way is to seek to bring order and structure into those times. For me, there comes a point when the clutter in my space or in my house becomes stressful. I can only watch the show Hoarders for so long before I have to take a walk or something. The idea of needing to create order, needing to remove clutter, helps bring comfort to a stressful situation. Many of you women may have experienced what they call the nesting instinct of right before a child is about to be born, there you seem to get into overdrive of getting ready. And again, creating order where there feels like there is chaos. We see this in the grieving process as well. For some, when they grieve, they need to go away and be alone and be in solitude. Others feel better when they are able to get back into their regular rhythm of life. I would count myself among those. Maybe that's you too. For me, one of the blessings of having the kids in school is the structure that it puts on our lives. And it's this idea that undergirds Psalm 25. Psalm 25 is categorized as an acrostic lament psalm. So let me break down those different parts. So number one, it's a lament psalm. It is a prayer that, as one author puts it, a prayer in pain that leads to trust. But the structure of it, and again, it's hard to see this in the English. Many of you may have a footnote in your Bible about this. But an acrostic poem is where each line is successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So if we were writing an acrostic poem in English, the first line would start with A, the second line would start with B, the first line would start with the third line would start with C and so forth. Now, this structure along with the content, I think helps us to apply the big ideas of Psalm 25. So just like we would say to cover a topic from A to Z, and to talk about the totality here, we're going to see a lament from A to Z. In addition, there's an order. There's a rigidity, in a good way, to having to come up with the next letter of the alphabet. So if we saw, if you saw printed out an English poem where every line was a successive letter of the alphabet, you would see the structure. You would say there's, there's a definite order here. As the author of Lament, as author writing a commentary about the book of Lamentations, which has a similar acrostic pattern, he says, the ordered and linear structure of these poems stands in contrast to the disordered pain and confused grief. So when we are experiencing chaos, when we are experiencing grief and hardship, God has given us an ordered and linear structure of Psalm 25 to pray to him, to read through, to bring structure into a life filled with chaos. 
And so with that in mind, we're going to go through this psalm and see the ordered life that God is calling us to live as we persevere through circumstances out of our control and circumstances of pain. So let's look at verses 1 through 3 of Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. One of the basic aspects of a lament psalm is that it is directed to the Lord. And it's a very basic part, but it is a profound part. That we are called to voice our complaints to the Lord. We're not encouraged to shout to the sky, but we are to cry out to the God who loves us. And in his cry of pain, David affirms his trust in the Lord. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. And he makes requests of the Lord to not let him be put to shame, nor let my enemies exult over me. In crying out to the Lord, he cries for protection and justice that can only come from the Lord. And we see, as we will see throughout this psalm, the confidence of David in the Lord. So in verse 3, Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. You can trust the justice of God, even when it seems like there is no justice in the world. And another important theme of this psalm is the description of God's people in verse 3. David describes himself and those who belong to God as those who wait for God. This will be repeated later in the psalm in verses 5 and 21. Three times in this psalm, God's people are those who wait for him. It is important to see that in times of hardship and pain, that sometimes we are called to wait on the Lord. It is a reminder that God is not on our schedule, and sometimes that waiting is long. I think that's one of the reasons a lament psalm like this is the length that it is. Because oftentimes our pain feels long and is long. But we are called to wait on the Lord because God is good and will bring justice. Verses 4 to 7 then move from talking about waiting on the Lord and crying out to the Lord to a submission to God's guidance. And that we need the teaching and forgiveness of the Lord. Now again, one of the elements of a lament psalm is making requests of the Lord. And there's two main categories in these verses of asking the Lord to teach him, but also asking for forgiveness. So let's first look at verses 4 and 5. Make me to know your paths, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. To get through this time in a way that pleases the Lord, David knows God must teach and lead him. There is an active side to our waiting. It is not just a sitting around waiting. It is a waiting that is built around following God in all things. The repetition of requests for God to teach David stand out here. As one author writes, the imitation of God requires a submission, submissive spirit to divine instruction for which he prays four times. There's an ongoing request for God to lead and teach. What does this look like in your life? When was the last time you prayed for God to teach you and lead you in the midst of hardship? I think there's a natural prayer in hardship, a prayer of rescue, 
a prayer of deliverance, and those are here. But we also must see maybe a prayer we didn't think of. That as we live our lives under circumstances out of our control, Lord, lead and teach me. But again, this teaching is done, verse 5. For you I wait all the day long. For you are the God of my salvation. God does save his people. God does deliver his people. And as we wait on the Lord, we live lives of loving obedience. We wait in hope on the Lord to rescue us. And while we wait, we commit ourselves to godly living and obedience. And again, it's understanding what obedience looks like. That obedience is an act of trust in the Lord to deliver us. But this is not the only request that David makes here. In verses 6 to 7, not only does he need the Lord's leading, but he needs the forgiveness of the Lord. Look at verses 6 and 7 with me. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Now, if you're reading through this for the first time, it may feel like a quick turn to go from, Lord, teach me and lead me to forgive me. And oftentimes, when we are in hardship and pain, we are not thinking about our sin and our need for forgiveness. But I think there's a couple of reasons that David includes this and it will come back again later in the psalm. Number one is sometimes hardship does come as a result of our sin. Sometimes God allows us to experience hardship as discipline to bring us to repentance. And so when we experience hardship, we need to ask of the forgiveness of the Lord. I had a friend who had a regular prayer of, Lord, if this is a result of my sin, show it to me that I may repent. The other reason is that in times of hardship, God often uses these to get our attention. And so that we can better understand the depth of our sin. Sometimes we need to hit rock bottom. You see this in people who are not yet believers. That oftentimes what brings them to faith is they are completely out of any other choices. (laughs) When you're on your back, all you can do is look up. And thirdly, either way, because God uses hardship in as many ways as there are people. Either way, God uses times of crisis and hardship to help us see the need for his mercy and forgiveness. In his book that I've referenced before, Coronavirus and Christ, John Piper writes, Physical pain is God's trumpet blast to tell us that something is dreadfully wrong in the world. And when we see what is dreadfully wrong in our world, when we see what is dreadfully wrong in ourselves, it is then that we cry out to the Lord, Remember your mercy, O Lord. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. We also need to see that forgiveness is not based on our deserving of it, but it is based on the holy character of God. Look again at verses 6 and 7. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love. Forgiveness here is based on who God is, And how he acts with mercy, love, and goodness. And we see how God has acted with love and mercy in the past. The reference to the sins of my youth. And verse 7, that his mercy has been from of old. But the sins of my youth also speaks to 
what one author calls the inadvertent errors of his youth. And so we see a total forgiveness that God offers. A forgiveness of sins of the past and into the present. A sins of transgression and the sins of ignorance. And that in times of hardship, we hold fast to the truth that God in his mercy will forgive our sins as he leads us in his paths. It's at this point that David moves from his request and his needs from God to declarations that he knows God will be good. Let's look at verses 8 to 10. Good and upright is the Lord, and therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right, and he teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. Now you'll notice the similarities here in verses 4 and 5. But whereas the psalmist makes the request in verses 4 and 5, here he declares with confidence that God will do what he has asked. The repetition is good because, again, as we walk through hardship, as we walk through the chaos of life, the brokenness of this world, it's not just one day of the week. It's not just that one bad hour that we had. And so the repetition of these themes speak to the ongoing journey through pain and chaos that this psalm takes us through. It also reminds us that as we move through difficulty, one of the things that will sustain us are the good habits of godly living, the patterns of following Jesus in every aspect of our lives. But as we look at what differentiates these verses from the earlier verses, a couple things we need to notice. One, God instructs us because he is good and upright. And because he is good in all that he does, and because he always does what is right, he will instruct and lead us. The other thing I want us to see is that God instructs us even though we are sinners. Verse 8 Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. This side of heaven, we are never totally free from our sin. And God shows us his mercy and his love. And that while we were still sinners, he leads us and guides us. And thirdly, central to God teaching and leading us is the call for us to be humble. The more I experience the Christian life, the more I read the Bible, the more I see the importance of humility. And that is at the center here. Verse 9, he leads the humble in what is right. If we are to follow the Lord, we must come to him in great humility. But after looking at God as teacher, David in verse 10 says, speaks to the rules and commands that he is teaching. And we see not only is God a good teacher, but God has good rules. Look at verse 10. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. In verse 10, the paths of the Lord, the the way that he wants us to live our lives are described using the same words that describe God in Exodus 34 when God reveals himself to Moses. The God who abounds with steadfast love and faithfulness, his paths are expressions of that love and faithfulness. It reminds us that every command of God is for our good. We may not always understand the how and the why, but when you come to the commands of God in your Bibles... David tells us that all the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. The next stanza in verses 11 to 15, again, taking us through 
this ordered psalm of living a life in the midst of hardship and uncertainty. At the center of these is David declaring that he will fear the Lord. Let's see what that means in verses 11 to 15. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the way that he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. His eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. As I said earlier, there are themes that are repeated in this psalm. And again, this part of the psalm repeats with a a request for God for forgiveness. To pardon his guilt. And we see explicitly an acknowledgement because the need to pardon my guilt for it is great. And from this request for forgiveness, he moves to speaking of how he then responds to the Lord who forgives. Again, as one author writes, assurance of forgiveness develops into responsiveness. He begins this section about being one of God's people with the all-encompassing term for proper response to God of fearing the Lord. And I think using this common term is helpful in that even when we are surrounded by things that cause us to fear, we must keep at the center our fear of the Lord, our reverence, respect, and acknowledgement that he is the almighty God of the universe. That when you have the fear of the Lord, you have the humility you need to receive the instruction of the Lord. But also when you fear the Lord and follow him, you will receive blessing. Look at verses 13 and 14. His soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him. When we fear the Lord, we are able to be united in friendship and covenant with him. And when we fear the Lord, and when we commit to him, verse 15, my eyes are ever toward the Lord, we can trust him for deliverance that he will pluck my feet out of the net. The psalm's final stanza cries out to God for deliverance as an act of confidence in God. Let's read verses 16 to 20. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Consider how many are my foes, and with what violent hatred they hate me. O oh, guard my soul and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem, O oh Israel, O oh God, out of all his troubles." Verses 16 to 20 build to the end of the psalm with various requests for God's deliverance. We can appreciate the volume of requests as representing the hardship that David is experiencing. He, in request, cries out to God in pain. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Bring me out of my distresses. Consider my affliction. Consider how many are my foes. And guard my soul and deliver me. The repetition of these calls to God to act and rescue him speak to the depth 
of pain and hardship that he is experiencing. And in that depth of pain and hardship, it is only through the action of God that he can be rescued. It is a true testament to his reliance on God in these circumstances. I also want to look at the descriptions of what he needs to be delivered from. There's variety here that is helpful to us. He is lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. He needs God to forgive all my sins. He has many foes who hate him with violent hatred. I appreciate the variety of reasons that David gives here. There's so many ways that we experience hardship and adversity, and this psalm speaks to that variety. How many times in this pandemic have you felt lonely and afflicted? There are times when we are overwhelmed and the troubles of our hearts are enlarged. And at other times, we experience the hatred of others. In all the ways that we can experience pain and hardship, our God is there to deliver us and sustain us. In any pain you experience, God is listening to your cries. And what do we do while we plead for God's deliverance? We persevere in integrity and uprightness. Verse 21. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. No matter what is going on around me, I can live a life that follows God's word, the way that he has instructed me to live. And while we persevere in obedience, we again wait for the Lord. This is there is a trusting patience that we must often practice while we wait on the Lord. But we do so knowing that He is faithful. Verse 22 actually breaks the pattern of the acrostic poem. It adds equivalent to our letter P to the end. And in doing so, again, when the pattern is broken, it calls our attention to it. And I think when David breaks the pattern, it creates what functions like our exclamation mark on this poem. In verse 22, David cries out one last time to the Lord. And in this time, he expands the scope of his cry, not just for himself, but for his people. He reminds us that while we may pray this individually, we should pray it for others, and we pray it as one member of God's community of faith. And it is an exclamation point that ultimately it is not our grit or determined obedience that will sustain us, but it is the hope we have in God to rescue and redeem his people. Verse 22, redeem Israel, O God, out of his troubles. So I'll come back to the question I began with. How do we persevere through hardship? This psalm gives us a great pattern. We begin by crying out to God in prayer. We live a life of humbly following God as our great teacher. We seek and rely on the forgiveness of God. We have confidence as we wait on the rescue of God. This pattern, the structure of this psalm, gives us order amidst the chaos. And the repetition of the theme speaks to the ongoing challenge of following God in hardship day after day, week after week. 
Hardship usually lasts longer than our 24-hour news cycle. And the order of this psalm gives us a solid support to lean on. Use this psalm to bring your complaints and requests before the Lord. When you are drowning in everything that is going on around you, use this psalm to anchor your soul in the midst of hardship and pain. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for Psalm 25. We thank you for the gift of lament in your word that gives us a pattern to cry out to you in pain. A a prayer that leads us through the pain to trust. God, that we would find order in the chaos of our lives through your word. And that we would rely on you as we seek to live lives of integrity and uprightness in every moment of our lives, following you, our great teacher. In your name we pray, amen. So receive this closing benediction from the end of Psalm 25. O guard my soul and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. Amen.